the Apostle Peter speaks of people who even deny the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. They deny the master who bought them. We see in First and Second Samuel this interesting, intriguing tragedy. Uh, first, let me just say, I don't know about you, but I think First Samuel 8 is probably the most amazing chapter to me in this set of stories. I would say probably not with 100% certainty, but few other chapters and episodes contending. First Samuel 8, for me, is one of the most significant, surprising chapters in the Old Testament. Because it's where Israel bucks God as king and God takes it. As he says to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And if you were God, what would you do about that? (laughs) Now don't hear me wrong, I believe God has his way. Maybe not in a way I would have my way if I were God. But God has his way. Is that fascinating or surprising? Or He's saying, they're deliberately disobeying me in such a massive way. Listen to them. As in, I'll let them have it. I'll let them win this one. God yields to humanity. And you read 1 Samuel 9, and you see God then does everything he can to deliver the king they want, Saul. He's a warrior, he's tall, he's handsome, and he comes from a noble family, on a platter. 1 Samuel 10, 9 even says that God gave Saul another heart. Saul prophesies. You want a king? Here he is, the kind of king you want, the best way I can give him. But then the intriguing tragedy happens. Even though God gave Saul another heart, even though God led Saul to victory in 1 Samuel 11, to borrow the language of Peter, Saul ends up denying the master who installed him as king and brings upon himself swift destruction. He rejects God. And the cues for Saul leading up to this rejection were were, were present from the get-go, really. He needs to be introduced to Samuel. Though Samuel, according to 1 Samuel 3, was known in all Israel. He needs to be schooled on proper worship, and his failure to give proper worship leads to his downfall. A war takes place, and he's afraid while his son Jonathan does the dirty work. Saul has a, a rash oath that his own men cause him to not live up to. Saul tries to take Samuel the prophet's job, and he gets chastised for it. A giant threatens Israel, and a young shepherd has to rise up to face that challenge, not Saul. Saul disobeys directions, rejects God, because God rejects him. And what's haunting is we've seen here and there evidences of the sinfulness of David. And perhaps emotionally invested onlookers of reading the history of Israel would begin to wonder, to think, what's what's David doing? Well, why is he doing those things? But I want us to see in the text this morning, it is the grace of God. We see, yes, hints of David's own sins that do lead him astray, but unlike Saul, we see a tender heart towards God from David. Because of the theme I see, I'm doing something a little bit interesting today. For those of you who may not be familiar with this, First and Second Chronicles retells a lot of Second Samuel and First Kings, maybe Second Kings, but kind of like Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the New Testament, a lot of Second Samuel is almost verbatim in some of the chapters of Chronicles. And for the theme I see, I'm going to bring in 1 Chronicles 14's text into bear on what is 
verses 17 through 25 in our text. So for the sake of 2 Samuel, I'm really covering what amounts to 2 Samuel 5 through 25. But in verses 17 through 25, instead of doing that, I will be switching over to 1 Chronicles 14 account of the same events. I read it for myself. They're almost verbatim, but it's just that, I don't know, 5, 10% difference that I really want 1 Chronicles 14. If you feel cheated, go ahead and read 2 Samuel 5, even while I'm reading to see the difference or read it later. So I do invite you to stand in honor of hearing the word of the Lord, if you're able to this morning. And let's read 2 Samuel 5, and then I'll hop over to 1 Chronicles in the middle. And the king, that's David, and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, Whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. And Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David. And cedar trees, also carpenters and masons, who built David a house. And David knew the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem, Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphelet. As you can tell, I'm not Hebrew. When the Philistines heard, this is over in 1 Chronicles now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went out against them. Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, go up and I will give them into your hand. And he went up to Baal Perazim. And David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a bursting flood. Therefore, the name of this place is called Baal Perazim, or bursting out. And they left their gods there, and David gave, David gave command, and they were burned. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, God said to him, You shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle. For God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him. And they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Let's pray. Father, again, we find ourselves reading history, wars, names that are kind of funny sounding. But we still cannot escape your New Testament instructions that these were written for your instruction. And we cannot escape that your Holy Spirit inspired the writing of these words. And that Holy Spirit uses his word to illuminate us and to fit us for righteous living. So, Father, open up our ears and hearts, peel back the culture and time and Father, speak directly to us. Give us a desire to follow you more closely. Father, to be in that relationship. Andy walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own. Father, we thank you that you want to have that connection with us. Indeed, you died for it. So, Lord Jesus, say what it is you desire and get me out of the way. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Since Abraham went up Mount Moriah, right outside, which was Jerusalem at David's time, perhaps this land has been holy. Something about it 
it would be where the temple is. Zion is first used here in the entire Bible in 2 Samuel 5, 7. Some have said it means bare hill, bare place. Others say the original Hebrew suggests something more like castle. Zion would come to mean Jerusalem and even all of, of Israel. And this, So this city of David is no doubt monumental in Israel's history. And while Saul failed as a king before David, it seems Joshua failed as a conqueror of this city before David. Judah was supposed to inherit this land. But Judah 1563 tells us that the tribe of Judah was unable to defeat the Jebusites. Benjamin, another tribe, claimed the territory then around this land. But the city itself was defended and the Benjaminites were not able to drive out the Jebusites. But there seems to be something about David. When his brothers or countrymen cower before Goliath, David advances. When armies come in to pillage Israel and Saul does nothing, David rises and defends. When kings have ruled by blood, lust, and fear, David has wanted to use patience and diplomacy. And where David's own forefathers, Joshua, warriors, no doubt David would look, to, look up to, have failed to capture this city promised by God to Israel, David will now capture it. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off, thinking David cannot come in here. If the Jebusites know their own history, which I believe they do, they might think, This is Israel, trying again. We've won every time against them. We'll win again, David. Your people are so weak that our lame and blind will successfully keep you out of the city. Do you ever have those sorts of problems? Generational sins. Generational problems. My dad had a hot temper and a hard relationship with me. And just carrying on the family legacy, I'm developing that with my own child. It's our own curse. Maybe on a grander scale, you ever think that? Our previous generation dealt with this so societal sin. It's still around in our generation. It's going to be in the next. The Jebusites knew. They knew Israel. They knew those people. Why are they back again at the same impregnable city trying to, to do what they know will fail? But maybe in the time of Joshua, maybe there were Achans running around. I'm not saying directly the case in Joshua 15, but maybe those sorts of sinners, maybe a little pride, maybe a little overconfidence brought them down. Maybe in the time of judges, I don't know, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And maybe the Benjaminites sought little to no direction or guidance, so they failed. But when David slew Goliath, he didn't rely on his own strength, but God's. And here, to skip to verse 10 for a moment, we, we read that David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. I don't know about you, but even when I'm dealing with the same problems time after time, I forget this. I don't take advantage of this. And it's not unheard of. Saul fell. The king Saul fell. He, despite the fact that he had everything he needed to be the king he should be. Verse 7, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him go up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore, it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Now, some say that David is now using their own phrase back on the Jebusites. And that he was calling the entire lot of them the lame and the blind. And after conquering the city, he expelled them. He never let the Jebusites back into Jerusalem again, or maybe at least in his court. In 1687... Excuse me, 1867, I have a little list dexia there. <laughs> One Charles Warren discovered the remains of an elaborate vertical shaft 
uh, water system in Jerusalem. It's now called Warren Shaft. It dates to this period. Its purpose was to bring uh, water from a spring outside the city into the city. Could be the one and same shaft that David was referring to. According to the telling of this story in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 6 tells us that it's the infamous Joab who took this challenge, and so then he officially became David's chief commander. Perhaps it was a moment of, of redemption and reconciliation. If you remember, Joab had murdered General Abner of the north, who was trying to talk terms of peace and unity with David to make one whole Israel. Verse 9 And David lived in the stronghold and called it in the city of David. And David built the city all around from the millow. Some translations here would have supporting terraces. They're artificial raised platforms where houses and whatnot were built. So David built the city from these terraces inward. And then we see that summary again. And David became greater and greater for the Lord of the God of hosts was with him. This is a consistent summary of David that started all the way back in 1 Samuel. In fact, when when David is first invited to King Saul's palace, and Saul uh, didn't have iPods then, but he was having bouts of madness, and he asked his advisors what to do, and his advisors think, you know, music is a good idea. And they introduced David this way. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Furthermore, two chapters later, David slew Goliath. Saul was getting jealous. That's what he does best. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but departed from Saul. So Saul removed him, David, from his presence, and made him a commander of a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. Saul's thinking he's going to kill him. I'll just put him in war all the time. And David had success in all of his undertakings, undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And you say, and he's David, King David. God has a plan for his life. He's the king after God's own heart. It was set in stone. It's meant to be, but not me, Kevin. The Lord's not with me. And yes, it's, it's God's word, it's history, it's come to pass. But the story was being written as David walked the earth. And the pages weren't set in ink yet. And furthermore, the promise of God, of Jesus, is this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, says Jesus, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The helper, the Holy Spirit, God is with us. The Lord is still with us. So much so we're instructed by Paul. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Christ has made it possible, absolutely possible, for us to be David's and not Saul's. And that's for all people. What's your Jerusalem? What is your your history of failure? Can you overcome it? Can you conquer it? Now, now the thing we need to watch out for is this. I'm not preaching, or you shouldn't be hearing, Kevin, I've I've wanted this Lamborghini for so long. This material thing, and each time I try to buy it, it's just the money's not there. But you're saying God's with me. So I'm not I'm not talking about self-indulging desires. Was it self-indulging for David to want Jerusalem? Well, as I mentioned, it's been attempted before. Might mean something to God as Abraham as it was sent to Moriah. It's been promised to Israel. Politically speaking, Hebron, which is where David had been ruling from, is decisively a southern city, and David had just united a northern and southern Israel. And so it's likely he wanted a more central location Jerusalem was either right on the border or only a few miles into the northern territory, the tribe of Benjamin. And when David takes it, he doesn't take it for selfish reasons. It's a politically, geographically astute location to have such capital. But now note this brief summary. And Hiram, king of Tyre, now Tyre is actually still a city. It's on this little 
jutted out inlet in the Mediterranean. But in David's time, it was its own island kingdom. It's been artificially filled in over time. It had a cultural and commercial influence. It was a big deal. And they're sending messengers to David and cedar trees. Now, this, these are the, the legendary cedars of Lebanon. And that day, it was like the best of the best. Kind of like, these aren't in any potatoes. They're Idaho potatoes. <laughs> Uh, These aren't any onions. They're Walla Walla onions. Or if you're my grandmother, Vidalia onions. Cedars of Lebanon, not just on any old lumber, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. So are you catching this? It seems like the text says he's hardly become king of a united kingdom. A few years maybe into it, but he has a well-known neighboring nation saying, let me just build your palace. Let me send supplies and designers and laborers. And it's it's an affirmation of his authority and kingship from a foreign nation. It's likely a goodwill offering. Let's be our friends. Let us trade through your land. Plus, it's not like David's story has gone unnoticed. The Philistines, who will rear their ugly heads here later in the text, knew when David entered their country... So if you know your first Samuel, he entered their country. They knew who he was. They knew the drama that was unfolding between he and Saul. So David's story and his heroics are known probably both by Felicia and Tyre. And now he's king of Israel. And now foreign nations are recognizing that. Verse 12, and David knew that the Lord had established his king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom For the sake of his people, Israel, this is a 180 turnaround from King Saul. If you read 1 Samuel about chapters 9 through 15, Saul is just kind of flabbergasted, naive, a bumbling idiot. Me, king? Okay, that sounds cool. Don't know why he sounds that way, but he's hiding at the coronation ceremony. Something tells me maybe he's a little worried. Doesn't seem to want to be king. Doesn't know what he's doing with Samuel. Tries to do Samuel's job for him. He doesn't fight battles. And he really doesn't stand for anything or anyone until Samuel says to him, Nice try. Now the kingdom's going to a better neighbor. Then Saul grows a backbone and he decides to stand for himself. His kingdom becomes about he keeping it. Early on, David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of himself. No, of his people, Israel. David realizes it's not about him or keeping his reign. This is an affirmation of God's grace. And when God empowers you to do something or to be someone, did you know it's not about you? It's about him. And it's about his people. Let me say that again. When God empowers you to do something or to be someone, it's not about you. It's about him and his people. We see this in one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I feel like I quote it a lot. Probably because I feel like I just don't see it lived a lot. Hebrews 11. All these faithful saints of old. None of it was. And God made Noah a master boat craftsman. And Noah felt pretty good about his talent. (coughs) No, it was God made Noah a master boat craftsman, and Noah felt Noah said, guess what? I'm about to save the world from a flood. It's about other people, and it's about God bringing judgment. It's not about me. Abraham was called to glorify God. Come out from all that pagan idolatry and make a new nation. Abraham was called for the sake of God's people and that new nation. Moses was called to glorify God. Hey, show Pharaoh who's really God. And guess what? Moses, it's not Pharaoh. (laughs) Moses was called for the sake of God's people. Release them from captivity. David knows his place before God. David knows he's called by God to be a king for God's sake and the sake of his people, not for his own glory. And that is where David and Saul differ. That's where you and I should take the hint. Especially as we go into the next movement. We should take the hint. David and Saul are both human, but David realizes what a relationship with God is about. About God and his people. Even so, David is still human. We see in verses 
13 through 16. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. After he came from Hebron and more sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon. Knowing Solomon's birth story later, we should see that this in 2 Samuel 5 is likely a summary statement of who's going to be born to David in Jerusalem, but it's not saying, oh, and he just popped these kids out left and right. No, it's not that. It's just giving you a summary statement. Verse 15, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphet. Eliphelet. And I said this when we went through 2 Samuel 3, and we, we read a a similar summary of David's growing harem and marriages. We know that this is how ancient kings and queens expanded their power, sometimes strategic marriages. And so some might be content to read the Bible and say, well, that's the culture. We shouldn't condemn them too much for it, whatever. But I brought this up before, too. While God didn't want to be rejected the way he was rejected in 1 Samuel 8, when Israel rejected him and won a king, The law did make room for a monarchy in Israel. Deuteronomy 17.15 says, You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers, and you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you, but one who is not your brother. But then among the expectations God would have for a king ruling his people, he says, And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. So yes, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. We're going to see likely that his first wife, Saul's daughter, Michael, is going to be relegated to basically a prisoner of the harem in the next text we read. My point is is that despite the fact that God is with David, Just like we know that by God's grace, his Holy Spirit is with us, we sadly still sin. We sadly still give into things we shouldn't give into. See, it's bittersweet that the text that that Israel leans into such a long time building up to, to David's rise to the throne, but then these reservations show up. David's not going to have Saul's problems, but David's also not going to perpetuate a godly throne forever his heart will turn away at times and his own kids some mentioned here some mentioned back in second samuel 3 will suffer because of it and so what we see here is david lets us down he lets us down that that, that's the emotions it should inspire but did you know that david knew this too that he's no savior he's no god himself If David penned Psalm 146, which that's debated, no doubt Psalm 51 certainly lets us know that David would undoubtedly subscribe to the truth of Psalm 146. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. I don't want you to hear that that I'm excusing David to be sinful. Or at least he's being unwise to take a route that would eventually lead to his acquiring a grand heron. But I am pointing out that David is succeeding and he's exemplary insofar as his heart is yielded to God. And so let it be with us that we should yield to him. Even though David is a man after God's own heart, his heart is still stupid enough to yearn elsewhere and to want lesser things. You know, there's a lot of good Christians in here, for lack of a better term. Jesus calls us. To, to, Jesus says to call no one good. Only His Father in heaven is good. But there's a lot of wise guidance, good examples to follow in here. But everyone in here, me included, can, would, and might even one day let somebody else down. It's sin. We're all sinners saved by grace and grace alone by the blood of Jesus. 
We should all be mindful day after day that the Lord is with us just as he was with David. And we should all be mindful day after day that our callings are to glorify God and help his people. And heaven help us when we succeed doing less than those things. In place of what would be verses 17 through 25 of Second Samuel 5, I'm turning over to First Chronicles. Almost the same telling of this chunk of text. But the additions and the word differences are why I find it favorable over this text. We pick up the story in First Chronicles 14, verse 8. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went out against them. The last time we'd had read about the relationship between David and the Philistines were in, was in First Samuel. David was an uneasy ally with them. He more or less sold himself as a mercenary to one of the five Philistine kings, a King Achish. Every time you said his name, you had to say, bless you. <laughs> Just kidding. But he was trying to get out of Israel, and he was trying to get out of King Saul's reign. He was close to going out to battle against Israel until four of the other Philistine kings thought it not wise. <laughs> We're going to battle against his country. You think he's going to fight for us? Okay, Achish. So they sent David back to the city in Philistia where he was staying, Ziklag, while the Philistines went out and they ravaged much to northern Israel, and that's when they killed Saul. Now, so many years later, maybe ten, maybe more, here's David who made himself king of Israel, all of Israel, and now David's a threat. Did He just, he just took Jerusalem. The, the Israelites haven't been able to get that for years. So, like, unlike Tyre, Philistia just wants to get David before David gets them. Now the Philistines had come out and made a raid in the Valley of Rephaim, that's a valley that leads straight to Jerusalem. And now look at this. And David inquired of God. Sounds like a great idea, David. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to him, go up. I will give them into your hand. This is the difference between David and Saul here. First of all, Philistines, again, they're responsible for not only killing Saul in a previous war, but... Way back, if you remember, like 14 years ago when I started in 1 Samuel, maybe only two or three, but um, back when the prophet Samuel still may have been a youth, the Philistines wiped out Israel and they took the Ark of the Covenant. And so for David, this is no, let's take on the Jebusites 2.0. This is a rival nation, a foe. And Saul would be doing one of a few things here. He'd be running away like a chicken. He'd be talking to a witch. He did that in 1 Samuel 28, if God wouldn't answer him. Or he might be putting out money to a general who would be willing to take the Philistines on. David goes right to the source of his strength, the only one who's going to grant him victory to God. And we shouldn't be saying, we should not be saying, David and God have speed dial on each other's bones. There's just a special relationship. It's not that. It's not that. God's playing favorites. He talks to David while he never spoke to Saul. So much that's why Saul felt like he needed to consult that witch. No. What we just talked about, David's a sinner like you and me. What's the difference? David's humble before the Lord. That's the difference. He's humble. I don't know how many people I've met who call themselves a Christian or at least say they believe in God, and then they think the relationship with God is transactional, like he's a business partner. I've done a lot of good things, so he should know that's not right. My good deeds will outweigh the bad deeds, so it's time God did. That's also not how it works. And this is Saul. Samuel would say, you disobeyed God, Saul, by letting all these things he told you to put to death live. And Saul's like, well, I intended to make a big offering for him. Like, it's not about how you can impress God. Let me just ruin it for you right now. You will never see it all coming. He'll never be wowed, shocked, and I need that guy on my team. I've been missing out. 
No, God looks for the stuff that we don't seem to want to do or give because it's hard for us proud sinners. Mm -hmm. Saul or others who have the same attitude say, I may be a sinner, but I'm not as bad as, right? I got some accomplishments under my belt. I got a three pound fallen brain. God says he rejected me, but you know, he didn't consult me in that decision first. The Philistines are coming. David isn't proud or cocky. He's taken down Goliath. He survived Saul. He invaded Jerusalem. But he's not certain. He's not confident or sure that he's going to win. He consults God. I'm only going if you're telling me to go. Yes. God answered him. And he went up to Baal Perazim, and David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand. Like, Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Perazim. And they left their gods there, and David gave command, and they were burned. If your gods can be left on a battlefield to be burnt, you need a better god, just saying. But this is supposed to show us. Like I mentioned that war where they took the Ark of the Covenant back in 1 Samuel 4. The Israelites lost the Ark because they were cocky and confused and indifferent to Yahweh. It's only after they lost the first battle in that war. Maybe we should have the Ark here. (laughs) Maybe that'll help us. So they bring the ark, and then they just get defeated and slaughtered. Did you know that by 1 Samuel 7, Yahweh had single-handedly delivered the ark back to Israel without Israelite lifting one finger? He just gave them all the plague, all the Philistines the plague, and they're like, we're sorry, take your God back. We're supposed to see now that under a David monarchy, the gods that are left on the battlefield are the Philistines one, and they're burnt to the ground. Period. But the Philistines don't give up easy. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, God said to him, You shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle. Quick side note, there was about 47 commentator notes on what could this mean? I wasn't going to bore you with that. So, for God had gone out to strike you down, to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer, or Gezer, about 25 miles. Uh, there's Geba. Uh, I, oh, there, there it is, yeah, Geba, and there's Gezer. Gibeon to Gezer, I guess. That, in other words, they're going back towards the Mediterranean. They're going back to their homeland. Verse 17. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. I took us over from Second Samuel 5 because this summary statement was not in there. There was summary statements throughout the other episodes, right? For the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Or David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he'd exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And then despite some suggestive developments of more women, we now hear in the fame of David went out into all lands and the Lord brought fear of him upon all nations. I have been comparing, no doubt a a reason and desire of the author, This is not Saul. This is David, and the Lord is with him, and the Lord's working in him, and for him, and through him, and it is not in vain. God changed Saul's heart. Saul changed it back. God gave Saul a kingdom. Saul dishonored him. God rejected Saul as king. Saul fought that truth until he died. God changed David's heart. David yielded. God gave David a kingdom. David honored him. David will disgrace himself as king, but then he will seek God's forgiveness and God will forgive him. There's a choice. That's what the author is saying. There's a choice. God saves you. In the New Testament, God saves you. I open with saying that that Saul is like the man who Peter says denied the master who bought them. God gave Saul that chance, but he denied his master. Peter uses this language of buying in the first letter he writes, and he says, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear 
throughout the time of your exile. That's your life here, away from his presence, uh, I guess as it will be in heaven. Knowing that you were ransomed, that's the buying language, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, one of them being Saul, not with, perish, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter is saying, to use the language I'm using, don't let what Christ did be in vain. Don't let it be in vain. Do you believe that there are still Jerusalems to be conquered for Christ? Maybe one of them could be a Lewiston. Do you know that Christ has made you, he has saved you, he has given what you need for the sake of you to bring him glory in the upbuilding of others? Do you know that in the end, all nations will fear him? Just like David. So my exhortation is simple. Stay humble. Keep serving him. And don't let his ransom of you through his blood be in vain. Give him glory and know that your faith and your hope are in God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, uh, I have often felt as I've read through First and Second Samuel, man, I'm so much like Saul. All the ways I think, all the things I do. Sometimes do I just put on a, a facade. But then you show me David's really no better in a lot of ways. Except for in one major way, he is. He's humble before you. He doesn't resist correction. He receives it. And Father, that's the humility that I want to have. It's hard for me to pray, keep me humble, because sometimes you keep people humble through suffering or humiliation if they're unwilling to be humble voluntarily. But Father, our prayer is that your sacrifice through Jesus for us would not be in vain, but rather we would remain yielded to you humble before you. Father, there are still Jerusalems you want us to capture. Father, there are things you want us to do to glorify you and to glorify and to, for the sake of others. Father, we're looking forward to the day where all nations fear you. And many nations already do. Not just Israel fears Yahweh, but many nations fear Yahweh. So, Father, help us to continue to be David's to stay humble before you. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.